Carpe Diem. And if you have your Bibles, or if you don't, we can give you a Bible. We'll give you one for free tonight. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10 is our key scripture verse. And I'm going to put it up on the screens too for you. So that way you can just read it up here as well. But if you do need a Bible and you don't own one, 3D will give you one. So just after service, come up to the front of the stage. We'll have some Bibles for you. If you don't own one, we'd love to bless you with one. This is kind of our key scripture for tonight. Here we go. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the realm of the dead, where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. I love how he just kind of makes it plain. Like he's like, we're all going to die. Um, and I mean that is kind of depressing this guy he was the wisest man in the world back then his name was Solomon and at the same time he was very depressing during this whole book but this one scripture I think the very beginning of it is is the most important part and that is whatever your hand finds to do do it with all your might do it with all your heart and um, tonight we're going to talk about how do we seize the day how do we make the most of our year this year and Those of you who don't know who I am, my name's Paul, my wife Ashley and I, we pastor here at 3D, and we would love to connect with you, we'd love to talk with you after service, if it's your first time, come and connect with us, we'll be hanging out around here or by the the doors, but tonight, before we get into this, let's pray. God, we thank you just for your mercy and grace, God, we thank you just for dying on the cross for us, God, thank you for giving your life for us so that we could have life to the fullest, and Lord, tonight, I pray that you would speak that it would not just be me up here talking, but God, you take over tonight. Lord, I thank you that you've brought people here tonight for a a big purpose, that they're not here on accident. And so God, as you speak, I pray, Lord Jesus, that our ears would be open to receive and our hearts would be ready to receive and silence every critical voice, every preconceived idea about this word or this service or this ministry. God, I thank you, Lord, that our hearts would be ready to receive from you, Jesus. And tonight, God, I pray, Lord, that you would speak the word that we need to hear for not just this week, but for the rest of this year. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, I remember playing baseball in third grade, and I remember stepping up to the plate, and it was practice, and my coach, this was coach pitch back in the days, he was winding up, and he was pitching the ball, and I didn't really know how to stand when I was getting ready to hit the the ball, and so I was kind of standing a little bit over home plate and a little bit off home plate, and he throws the ball, and I, I swing to hit the ball, and the ball hits me, and it hits me right in the place where it counts, not my stomach, right below that. And I fall to the ground, I drop the bat, and I'm like, oh, I hate baseball. And I was like, I want to quit. My dad was at the practice. I, I don't understand why dads come to practices as, as a kid. I don't know if your dad or your mom ever showed up to practices, but sometimes it just puts so much pressure on me, especially when I got hit in the bad place and I wanted to quit. And I fell over, and I'm like whining, and the whole team's kind of just watching me. And my dad walks over, and he's like, Paul, he's like, it's time to get up. I was like, okay. I was like, do I have to play baseball? I don't, I don't know if I like it anymore. He's like, come on, man. He's like, you can do it. You can do it. I believe in you, Paul. And so I, I got up, and it wasn't my turn to bat for a while. And then my turn came back around again, and I got back up at the plate. And the coach pitched the ball again, second time around. And I swing for the ball, and the ball hits me in the same place. <laughs> Twice in a row. That is bad luck right there. (laughs) No, not luck. We don't believe that. But that's just like bad karma, whatever you want to say. Twice in the same place in a matter of 30, 40 minutes. So then I fall over. I drop the bat and I'm just like, dad, I hate this sport. I want to quit. I'm done. I I don't want to play baseball anymore. And my dad comes over. He says, Paul, he's like, would you feel better if I pitched the ball? I was like, yeah, I guess so. He's like, get up on the plate. He's like, now, now, he's like, you're going to have to back off home plate a little bit. I was like, okay. So I backed off like eight feet. He's like, okay, get a little closer to the plate. And I was like, yes, sir. So I'm kind of like this, leaning in with the bat. He throws the ball. He hits me in the same place. I don't know what the heck is wrong with me, but I am not meant to play baseball. I got hit three times in the bad spot. <laughs> I dropped the bat, and I said, that's it. I quit this sport. I'm done with it. 
And I remember going over to the dugout, and my dad sat down beside me, and some of the players were laughing. One of my good friends, Jonathan Cousins, he remembers it. I was telling him about it, and he was laughing, just thinking back about that moment. And I remember my dad talking to me. He said, Paul, he said, sometimes we're going we're gonna to strike out or get hit by the ball. <laughs> and he said, uh, when we do, we've got a decision to make. We've got a choice to make. We're either going to get back up and keep playing or we can quit and leave the field. I was like, I choose the second option. I was like, I'm not called to play baseball. And he was like, well, Paul, he's like, you're in the middle of the season. He said, you may not think you're good at it, and you may not think the team needs you. And I, I thought the team didn't need me, but he said, Paul, it's important to finish what you start. It's important to complete whatever you put your hand to do, that you would finish it all the way through. And, and he also talked to me about not following suit with what my feelings may feel in the middle of a moment. And I think this is really important about this phrase, carpe diem, and seizing the day. It, it's, taking, it's taking an ownership of maybe what the day might bring against you. And it's choosing to get the most out of the situation you're in. It's choosing not to let the, the things that happen in our life to stop us from what we're called to do or to stop us from even just moving forward and, and continuing on in, in life and, and not giving up and not quitting. And I wanted to just read you a, a few quotes on this seize the day, this phrase that people wrote about. This, this one is a very important one I, I liked. This comes from a guy named Stephen Grillet, and he says, I expect to pass through this world but once. Any good, therefore, that I can do or any kindness I can show to any fellow creature, let me do it now. Let me not defer or neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. And I think what he's saying there is, this day comes only once. Whatever I can get, in this day, whatever I can do in this day, whatever I can give in this day, I want to give all I've got. I want to make the most of this day. If I can show kindness to somebody today, let me not put it off to tomorrow. Let me not put it off to tomorrow. Here's another one I like a whole lot. This one says, when one door closes, another door opens. But we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we miss the open ones. I think, and I talked about this last week, a big factor in why we miss seizing the moments and seizing the day is because we're still thinking about what happened last year. We're still thinking about what happened yesterday, what happened last weekend. And, 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 and we can't see what God wants to bring us right now because we're thinking about what we missed before. We're thinking about how we missed our opportunity or we missed our moments. And it's so important that we not get stuck in the past. Paul the Apostle, he says, Listen, this one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to forget what's behind me and I'm going to press forward to what's ahead of me. If we're going to make the most of this year, we're going to have to let go of last year. The good things and the bad things. It doesn't mean that you forget the lessons you learned or the wisdom you gained, but it means you let go of the attachments that you have to last year's success or last year's failures. How many made some mistakes last year? How many of you had some success last year? I mean, this is one of the most successful groups of people in the world right here. 3D, you guys are awesome. But I want to challenge you, don't get stuck in last year's success. Many of you guys are making a huge impact where you go to school and where you work and what you do. But God has greater things in 2013 for you. Let this be a year that you challenge yourself to go higher, to do more this year than you did last year. You know, I think one of the biggest epidemics in, in just our generation is there's kind of a, and I don't think it's necessarily across the board here at 3D, but I do, I do see it in different people, and there's this sense of lethargy, lethargic laziness, and it's not necessarily laziness like I'm not going to get a job or not going to go work, but it's more like whatever life brings my way, then I'll take it. Whatever, things, whatever happens, that's what's going to happen. However uh, things turn out, then that's how I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just roll with whatever the wind blows my way. And it's kind of this mindset of que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like I, I don't know if I can really change my circumstances or if I can really change the, the, the outcome of this year. I'm just going to let the year go on and things are going to happen. And, and I honestly think the devil... He, he, he's got this game that he plays with people that he, he won't take you out if he can get you to check out. He's not going to try and destroy your life if you've already gone to sleep um, with your dreams and you've gone to sleep with your passion and you've lost your enthusiasm for life. 
See, the devil doesn't have to mess with somebody who's not really living, but just breathing. Does that make sense? And even though this, this scripture sounds kind of dark, I think what he's saying is full of life. I mean, this is really how Jesus lived is every day mattered. Every minute counted. That Jesus, he wasn't just coming on the earth to breathe and to, to exist, but he was coming to fully be alive, to fully live. I like the, the quote in Braveheart where he says, all men die, but not all men truly live. All men die, but not all men truly live. I heard uh, someone say, actually, how many of y'all remember when that plane went down in the Hudson River a few years ago? And every person on that plane made it out alive. It was, it was called the Miracle on Hudson, the Hudson Miracle. What happened was a plane was looking like it was going to crash, and it ended up landing in the Hudson River. And, I mean, people were thinking, surely there's going to be dead bodies coming out of that plane, coming out of that river. Every single person got out. And one of the guys was interviewed, and they said, what, what's happened to you? What, did, what, you know, what did you think, the fact that you're alive, and you saw all these people get out? He said, you know, he said, I, I used to think that I was living. He said, but since that incident, he said, now I'm really alive. And I thought that was really interesting when I heard that. Now I'm really alive. Of course he was alive before that, but something changed. He realized the shortness of life, that life is here today and gone tomorrow. So whatever you're going to do, do it with all your might. Don't sit back and just let the days go by and let the year pass by and let it bring whatever it brings. No, seize the day this year. Seize the moment. Don't live in yesterday's failures. Don't live today with shame and regret from the past or, or daydreaming about the future. Make the most of your todays. Have a bunch of todays this year. Not yesterdays or tomorrows. Have a bunch of todays this year. Have a bunch of moments where you really just make the most of the day. And how do you do that? You do that by living to give. Not just getting out of the day, but giving to others. You do that by serving people. I was telling our volunteers, our greatest moments in life are when we serve people, not when other people serve us. Jesus, came, Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. Our greatest moments in life are not when somebody gives us gifts, it's when we give somebody else a gift that they could never repay us back. Our greatest moments in life is when we do something for somebody else that helps set them up in a bigger way. Because when you make others' dreams come true, God will make your dream come true. If you're only living selfish this year, don't expect God to do some great things on your behalf. But when you start giving out and serving and helping others, man, you can expect God to get involved in your life, to really bring those miracles like Ross was talking about where you're getting that free car. <laughs> some of us are kind of listening to that testimony saying like, how does he get that? Why didn't I get that free car? I need a free car. How many of y'all would like a free car? Come on, I'm right there with you. But you know what? The way to get it is not by walking around and asking for it. <laughs> it's not by walking around and saying, could you give me a free car? <laughs> now, I know you may say, well, the Bible says ask and it will be given. I hear you. I agree with you on that. But at the same time, part of the action and the, the part of asking is setting yourself up to where you've already built in gifts towards others and helping other people and serving other people because honestly it's 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 like a bank account no deposit what's the other word no withdrawal <laughs> i had i had a moment there no deposit no withdrawal i like this quote right here normal day let me be aware of the treasure that you are let me learn from you, love you, bless you before you depart. Let me not pass you by in quest of some rare and perfect tomorrow. Let me hold you while I may, for it may not always be so. One day I shall dig my nails into the earth or bury my face into the pillow or stretch myself tout or raise my hands to the sky and want more than all the world your return. She's talking about the normal day. She says, normal day, let me be aware of the treasure that you are. Here's the deal. Here's my question for you tonight. If, if seizing the day means denying your emotions, denying your circumstances, not allowing those things to dictate how you're going to react to the day, then the question really is, who's leading your life? Who is leading your life? Who leads you? Do your emotions lead you? Do your temptations lead you? Do your regrets lead you? Do your circumstances lead you? 
And I want to tell you tonight, guys, I was praying about tonight and I felt like God was saying, this is going to be a year of freedom in your life. Freedom from drugs, freedom from alcohol, freedom from sexual immorality, freedom from pornography, freedom from wrong relationships, freedom from wrong mindsets. God's saying, listen, you don't have to live this year in bondage, maybe like you did last year, the years before. Don't buy into the lie that it has to keep going like this. The question is, who's going to lead you this year? Is it going to be the past addictions that you've had? Because you don't have to go back to last year. You don't have to repeat that. My challenge for you this year is that you would step up and be the leader God's called you to be in your life. Be a leader in 2013. Lead in your life. Lead above your emotions. Lead above your circumstances. Lead above the temptations that come in your life. Rather than having this lethargic mindset that says, well, it's, it's easier to give in to temptation than it is to fight temptation. That's what laziness says is, it's easier for me to sin than it is for me to do good. It's easier for me to go back to my old habits than it is for me to create new habits. That's true. It is easier. But God didn't invite you to live an easy life. And then a lot of people think that maybe becoming a Christian is stepping into an easier life. No, you, you go up another level. If you want to go up another level, there's some things in your life that are going to have to change. You want to walk out the, the, the freedom that God's given you you're going to have to make some decisions to no longer give in to the flesh and, and the addictions of your past. So the question tonight is, who's going to lead you this year? My challenge is that you would be the leader God's called you to be. I'm going to give you real quick four ways to lead this year. Four ways to lead this year. Number one, you got to see like a leader. Everyone say see. How do we see like a leader? We see the potential in others. We see potential in ourselves. We see opportunities. We see the positive even in negative situations. We see with eyes of faith when others doubt. We see with eyes of love towards all people, even, even annoying people. You know, um, it's sometimes hard to, to see with eyes of love when you don't understand why people are the way they are. But you got to give people the benefit of the doubt. You may not know what they're going through. You may not know what they're dealing with. This year, instead of reacting with anger or frustration or impatience or getting mis misunderstandings and having difficulty in your relationships, choose to see with eyes of love this year because a leader sees with eyes of love. A leader doesn't react. A leader responds. Someone who reacts is someone who lets their emotions lead them. But someone who truly leads, they're able to look at a person and say, I know they may be treating me bad. I, may, I, I know they may be... Uh, dissing me or talking down to me or, 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 or treating me with a cold shoulder, but I don't have to react and be the same way back. I can choose to control my emotions, control my feelings, and respond with love because I see with eyes of love. But also seeing potential in other people, seeing the, the God factor in other people, not letting other people in your eyes become uh, unworthy and not letting yourself become unworthy. You know, there's a fine balance between seeing other people's potential and also seeing your potential because sometimes we can see others way more than we can see ours. And I think that this is kind of where comparison starts. We start looking at somebody else and we start thinking, man, they've got a really good life. They've got a really good job. They've got an awesome wife. <laughs> they've got an awesome husband. They've got an awesome uh, opportunity. And we start thinking, I wish I had their life. I wish I had their job. I wish I had their wife. I wish I had their husband. I wish I had their situation, whatever it is. And this is where, honestly, this is where we miss seizing the day is we, we get our eyes off of our race and we start looking at other people's race and we waste time. This is the biggest thing that steals our time. I shouldn't say the biggest thing. This is one of the biggest things is starting to look at other people. I've been there before. I'll start going on Facebook or Twitter and looking at people's updates, and I'm like, man, they look like they're having the time of their lives, and I'm just here in my office. I'm like, man, these people look like they're having so much fun, and man, their life just looks incredible. And, and, and sometimes we can allow our eyes to shift off of what God's called us to do and start looking at other people. And I, I want to tell you something tonight. You, you will never be passionate about your life 
if you're always looking at how great other people's lives are. You'll never be satisfied with your life until you learn to enjoy the life God's given you. If you're always discontent with the life God's given you, don't expect to be seizing any days. The days are going to be taking a toll on you because you're constantly looking at other people and constantly comparing. And I want to challenge you this year, don't waste your time comparing yourself to other people. Don't waste your time thinking, oh man, I wish I had their life. I wish I could do what they could do. No, be you. You be you. Turn to somebody next to you and say, you be you. Be the best you you can be. There's nobody that can be a you better than you can. Nobody can be you. Jay, nobody can be Jay better than Jay can. Nobody can be me better than I can. Don't be a second rate somebody else. Be you. Be, be the best you you can be. And the way you do that is you begin to see what God's put inside of you. See with eyes of faith. You may not see that the situation you're in right now physically looks awesome, but God's got a plan where you're at. God wants to do something in you. God's placed some awesome leadership qualities inside of every single one of us. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here on this earth. There's a God factor inside of you. You have what you need to lead. So begin to see the way God sees you. I like what David said. He said, I'm going to praise you, Lord, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Give thanks to God. When you're tempted to compare yourself, give thanks to God for how he's made you. Number two, think like a leader. So number one is see like a leader. Number two is think like a leader. Think about solving problems, not just bringing problems up. See, someone who's not a leader, they always bring the problem up. They're like, hey, uh, did you hear about this problem? Hey, there's a problem over here. Hey, we got some problems going on. But a leader says, hey, there's a problem and I know how to fix it. I'm the man for the job. Think like a leader. Think about creating opportunities for others, not just getting opportunities for yourself. Think about the effects of your decisions before making them. This is huge. So many people think that seize the day is, is like, YOLO. <laughs> like, I'm going to go do this now. And they don't even think about it. And they just get wasted. And then they wake up the next day and they have no clue what they did. And we read it on Twitter. They're like, I don't know what the heck happened to my life last night. There's a monkey in my bedroom. <laughs> Some of y'all still got the hangover from 2012. And I don't mean like an alcoholic hangover. I mean you're still thinking about your regrets from last year. They're hanging over your head. The devil's reminding you of your past. God sets you free from whatever happened in your past. But here's the way that you're going to receive it. It's by getting in his presence, getting on your knees, and saying, God, I'm sorry for my past, and I receive your forgiveness so that I can live out today the way you've called me to live it. And tonight, you're going to get that opportunity. But you've got to begin to think like a leader. Think before you act. Think before you speak. Really think through things. You know, you're one thought away from doing something great, and you're one thought away from doing something stupid. Because as a man thinketh, so is he. Whatever you think about eventually comes out of you. If you're thinking about doing something wrong, you're probably going to end up doing something wrong. If you think small, you're going to live small. If you think big, you're going to do something big. If you think wrong, you're going to do wrong. If you think right, you're going to end up going the right direction. But we got to get our thoughts in line. And, and in other times, I was thinking about this, sometimes we try and control what other people think about us. We're concerned so much about what others think about us. And I've been there before where I'm just like, I tell Ashley, I'm like, honey, what do they think about me? You know, what, what's, my mom, what's, what's Pastor Bruce thinking about? What's my mom thinking about? What was my dad thinking about me? You know, and I was always concerned about what others were thinking about me. And I, I love just what my wife brought to my life whenever we got married. She said, Paul, you're going to have to let go of what others may be thinking about you. Because they don't dictate the course of your life. Their thoughts didn't make you, and their thoughts can't break you. Think about that. Their thoughts didn't make you, and their thoughts can't break you. You can't control other people's thoughts, but you can control yours. And you don't need to be thinking about controlling other people's thoughts because you got enough work cut out for yourself just trying to control your own thoughts. So work on your thoughts. Get your thoughts in line. Think positive. Some people are always like, man, I don't like this positive mumbo jumbo. Okay, think negative. See where that gets you. You want me to say that? There you go. But here's the deal. Your thoughts are either dragging you down or they're pulling you up. 
Your thoughts are either dragging you down. I'm such a loser. I look so fat. I'm so ugly. Okay. You want God to agree with you? Well, he doesn't. You want your, your future spouse to agree with you when you say you're so ugly and so fat? No? Then quit saying it about yourself. Think like a leader. Think positive. Quit thinking of yourself so nasty and ugly and, and bad. <laughs> think of yourself the way God thinks of you. God loves you. You're so beautiful. My wife is the most beautiful woman ever. And I'm always telling her that. And I want to challenge you future husbands. Always tell your wife every single morning and night how beautiful they are. Always do that. <laughs> think like a leader. Think like a leader. If you think you can't get up, you probably won't get up. If you think it's not going to be a good year this year, it probably won't be a good year this year. Because as someone thinks, so shall they be. As someone thinks, so shall they be. Number three. So we got number one, see like a leader. Number two, talk, think like a leader. Number three, talk like a leader. Talk like a leader. Speak life over yourself. Speak potential. Speak positively. Speak wisdom. To speak wisdom, you have to think before you speak. Get rid of trash talk. No more cutting others down. Use your words to build people up. Don't talk about yourself the whole time. Give shout outs to others. Now, this is a big one here. This is something we got to think about. A leader learns to talk and celebrate other people. And that's something that I think, as young adults, we should aspire to be. It's hard to get there at this age. And I, I've been struggling to, to continue to challenge myself. I can't always be talking about me. How can I lift others up? And when you're in a room with people, people don't like being around you when you're cutting them down the whole time. Newsflash. In case you didn't know that, if you're like the sarcastic cutter downer person and you think that's so cool, people don't like that. <laughs> I've been in the room before where there's just somebody cutting down everybody in the room and I'm just like, we don't like that. We like you, but we don't like the way you're being. You know what I'm saying? And we got to learn to love the people that still cut us down. But we got to be those people that build people up this year. Challenge yourself this year to talk like a leader. A leader doesn't cut people down. A leader builds people up. If you're the person in the room that's tempted to cut people down often or to be sarcastic or to speak negative over situations or to talk about somebody in a negative light when they're not around, don't do that because a leader doesn't do that. If you want to carpe diem this year, if you want to carpe the stinking diem this year, you better talk like a leader. You need to carpe the freaking diem out of this year. Don't judge me. I didn't think before I spoke. You can judge me. <laughs> this is what David said in Psalms 118, verse 24. He said, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Now listen, David had a lot of negative things he could have said. He was going through a lot of difficult times. Many times where David was in the, in the um, caves, hiding from his father-in-law, throwing spears at him. He could have been cussing or trash talking or talking dirty about Saul, talking dirty about his, his wife who was making fun of him, Michal or Michal or however you want to say it. But David chose to say things that were positive. There's, sure, there's psalms where he gets a little depressing, but most of those depressing psalms, he turns it around in the last verse and he says, but my hope is in the Lord and I'm trusting in God. And I love this scripture here. This is the day the Lord has made. To seize the day, you have to see the day for what it is. It's the day the Lord has made. Every day is a day the Lord has made. Whether it's raining, whether it's thundering and lightning, whether you got fired from your job, it's the day the Lord has made. Rejoice. You can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you respond to it. So make it the day that you're speaking life over the day. You're speaking words of hope over yourself, over your future, not words of death, because what you speak is what you're going to get. What you speak is what you're going to get. If I'm always speaking negative over my life or negative over my wife, chances are I'm not going to get positive things back from her or positive things back in my life. I've got to speak things that are hopeful over my life, over my future. I talk about my future often. I say, God, I thank you. I have favor in my future. God, I thank you, Lord, that you're, you're surrounding me with the shield of your favor. God, that you're watching out over my coming and my going. God, I thank you, you set me up for success. 
God, you are my promoter. You're my provider. And God, I thank you that you will, just as you have done in the past. That's, that's speaking life over your future. Speak it. Number four, walk like a leader. So number one is see like a leader. Number two is think like a leader. Number three is talk like a leader. And here's the last one, walk like a leader. Act on your opportunities. Be quick to help. Be an action person. Be on your guard against temptation. Carry yourself with humility and confidence. That's a tricky thing right there. Show compassion to as many as you can. Take ownership of the places you live and work. Make things better. Don't just maintain. Take things to a whole nother level. You like how I put that in there? Here's the deal. A leader, they take action. They don't just talk about doing things. They do them. Love does. Leadership does it. It gets the job done. You guys, y'all are the leaders. This year, whatever you're doing, take it to the next level. Even if you don't like your job, take it to the next level. I love, I went to, uh, on a mission trip this last summer, we were going through the airport and we were coming upon the security. And normally those security people are cranky pants. They're like, yeah, get through the thing, you know, and they're like yelling, like, take off your shoes, get your socks off, dude. Get on, I didn't tell you to walk forward, you step back right over here. And they're always cranky. But this one guy at the security, and I think some of the missionaries will remember, but this one guy was like, he was doing an entertainment show. People were stopping, and they wouldn't even go on to their gate. They were watching this guy because he was like doing the moonwalk and then dancing and telling jokes and acting like he was juggling. He was one of the security guard guys, and he was just making the most of his job. And I asked him, I was like, I was like where do you get this joy? He's like, well, I can either be mad, I can be sad, or I can choose to be happy. And he's like, I'm choosing to make the most of where I work. And I thought, man, that's an awesome attitude. Leaders make the most of where they're at. They take places to another level. When you go into work, do you bring it down a level with your attitude or do you take it up a level? It may not be where you want to work, but if you can't be happy with where you're at, God can't take you to where you want to be. You've got to get to this place where your attitude is like, man, when I go into work or when I come back to the dorm room or back to my apartment, I'm going to take it up a notch. I'm going to come in with some enthusiasm. When I was working at ORU as a janitor, I was cleaning up the, uh, the baseball stadium. I was picking up some nachos that people spilled and picking up gum. And I was so frustrated that these people would leave gum in the baseball stadium. But I remember I started worshiping God. I started writing songs when I was just walking through the, the baseball. And I remember some guys coming up to me and they're like, dude, why are you always singing? I was like, I don't know. I just like to sing. I just, and I would bring this atmosphere of worship to where I worked. And I, I wasn't rejected for it. They didn't say, don't do that. But you know what? At the same time, even if I was, it wasn't going to stop me from worshiping on the inside. See, you can choose when you go into work whether you're going to have a, a, a cranky attitude or whether you're going to be the person who brings the atmosphere up. This message is challenging me too. Tonight when I was praying over this message, I felt like God was saying, Paul, every one of these four things is something that we all have to grow in. We have to think like a leader. We have to see like a leader. We have to talk like a leader. And we have to walk like a leader. When we go into places, do we change the atmosphere? Do we bring God's grace into it? See, I love what, what that wisdom, that scripture says. He says, whatever you do, do it with all your heart. Do it with all your might. If you're gonna do something, don't just do it half-heartedly. Don't just do it with just part of your uh, uh, energy. Bring everything you can to the plate. Every season counts. 2013 matters. Take every opportunity that comes your way. And I look back on the last 27 years of my life, and some of y'all have no clue about my past. But honestly, being on this stage, it, it, it really is God's grace. I remember when I was going through high school and just the, the way that I was with God, with people, and I, I really had a messed up perception about God and myself. I really didn't see God as, as a loving father during that time. I honestly was really confused with with his love for me and confused about my identity and my purpose. And then when I got into college, something happened. Something broke on the inside of me. God started working on me. Right when I graduated my senior year, God started really pulling on my heart, tugging on my heart to really see him as a loving father. I started taking every opportunity I could. I served here at 3D for four and a half years underneath my sister and brother-in-law. I remember leading worship and some weeks I would 
work so hard and come up with a worship set or I was also the video guy back then. I was making videos and I would work so hard on making a video and my brother-in-law, Caleb, he would look at it and say, you know, that's kind of a piece of crap. <laughs> he actually said that. And he'd be like, um, be like, Paul, we're not going to use that one. He's like, but good job trying. Keep trying. I was like, you totally squashed my 13 hours of working on that announcement video. And I was so upset. But see, this is, this is and Caleb was a great guy. It's just that I think my videos were really bad. Um, <laughs> like I really wasn't a good video maker. <laughs> but I realized during that time frame, God was doing something on the inside of me. Every season counted. And I can look back, and even when I was working at ORU as a janitor, or when I was there and I was a chaplain, or when I was working there for one of the conferences we used to do on campus, everything that I did, I tried to find, God, what do you want to teach me during this moment? See, leaders are always staying teachable. They're always students. When you graduate from college here, go ahead and enroll yourself in, in, in new school by just reading the Bible and going to church and praying and studying books. Don't ever stop being a student. Many of you are out of school. You're still a student. God still wants to teach you things in this season, whether it's at church or whether it's at work. Everything that you go through is a lesson to be learned. And it's also an opportunity for you to make the most of it. You know, the Chinese, they, they, ha they have this theory that even in the middle of crisis lies opportunity. That in fact, it's in the middle of crisis that the greatest opportunities arise. Sometimes we can look at this year and even look at our government, look at the economy and say, there's really not a lot of opportunities out there for young people. There's really not a lot of open doors for me to go out there and, and really make a big impact. But I think the Chinese have it right, and I don't think it's just by their own intuition. I think this is from God's word, that there's always opportunities for those who can see them. And there's always great opportunities for those who not only see them, but are able to see the God inside of them that's greater than any opposition, that's greater than any economy, uh, economic downturn, that you have the, the greater one living inside of you and that that leadership inside of you is gonna rise up this year. You are the future leaders of the world. You are the difference makers, the world changers. New companies will be birthed. New ideas will be created. New things will happen through you. Don't see yourself as someone who doesn't have creativity inside of you. You're creative geniuses, every single one of you. Just say, I'm a creative genius because God lives inside of me. When you're tempted to put yourself down or you look in the mirror and you immediately start seeing yourself as, as unworthy or unfit or not good enough, this year I want to challenge you. I'm telling you, the success of 2013 is hinging on what you do with this sermon. It really is. If you choose to just Throw these four things out. That's up to you. I'm going to make these four things something that I really want to apply this year in my life. That I'm going to see like a leader. I'm going to think like a leader. I'm going to talk like a leader. And I'm going to walk like a leader. The greatest thing that a leader can do is submit his leadership to the greatest leader. And that's God. The greatest thing we can do as leaders is, is realize we're not the top leader. That there's a greater one above us that deserves all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. That's the leader we bow down to. That's the leader we get our direction from. And when we submit our lives to him, when we say, God, I'm choosing to see me the way you see me. I'm choosing to think about my future the way you think about it. God, I'm choosing to speak words over my life like the words you speak in the word, in the Bible. God, I'm choosing to walk out the way I've seen you walk out in the scriptures. When we choose to do that, when we truly bring our life under submission, God takes whatever we have, takes whatever mess we're in, whatever addictions we're, we're breaking free of or thought patterns we're having to destroy in our life that are negative, he takes it all and he makes us new and he creates us into that leader we're called to be.